folks. Welcome to another episode of Film Study. This is Ken McKusick, and it's time for this week's matchups episode in preparation for this Browns game coming up on Sunday. Joining me to talk about the defense right now is Frazier Tafar. Frazier, how are you doing? Doing good, Ken. Glad to be back for the defensive matchup show. Uh, big division time game against Cleveland. Uh, second division game of the year, so very important in the division standings. Yeah, it really is. And if if they end up splitting with a team like the Steelers, which is certainly a possibility, you can't afford to let one get away against the Browns. It's a it's a team you got to beat, and a, a team you need for your uh, for the most important matchup of all, in a sense, the the winning the division, getting into the, the tournament at least as a three or a four. Um, I think honestly, the Ravens ought to have their sights set on no less than the two right now. I think it's actually quite unlikely they'll get the one. Look at the Chiefs' schedule, but the two is very achievable. Um, it basically means they're going to need to beat the Texans on Christmas. There, tough game, but they but it's doable. Um, or they might have to go back there again during the playoffs. Yep, and I think uh, really it starts with this week against this Browns team, continuing to keep the trend we have the past couple of weeks. And uh, starting off with the matchups, I have the Browns' new look offense led by Jameis Winston versus the Ravens' scheme. Um, There is some validity to the advantages that QBs have on their first start. There's less film on them, less data. So they're able to, the offensive coordinator, Stefanski in this case, is able to have different schemes and plays in that really fit Jameis rather than Winston, I mean, uh, Watson and uh, uh, who's the backup? DTR? Uh, actually, he's hurt. I think there's somebody else who might be the backup this week. Okay. But, I, but I haven't heard for sure yet. And, and I guess uh, tomorrow we'll get the final injury report on what's going on. But uh, Jameis is definitely starting. Yeah. So Jameis' play style is different from those two. So having that going for the Browns is going to be an issue. And I'm curious to see how or – is able to operate under those circumstances. It's a it's a interesting game for Orr, certainly. Uh, Jameis is a guy who should really help this defense get right, help them find their way. Uh, without Marlon Humphrey, they'll be without one of their big ball hawks, but this is certainly a team that, that, that has a lot of interception potential, uh, really all over this defense, frankly. I mean, Stevens is a, is a potential guy. Jameis lets the ball rip. Um, your linebackers, you know, having Hamilton at the dime back spot in particular. I mean, there's there's should be some turnovers happening in, in this game. Uh Wiggins, a guy who's had his hand on the football a lot. He'll likely be playing. So uh, you know, hopefully uh this is a game where they take advantage of of uh Jameis. There is plenty of tape out there on Jameis from past years. One thing that'll be a little bit different is I believe it's this week Ken Dorsey is taking over as the play caller for the Browns. And there was some question, this came up in the Know Your Foe episode, some question as to whether he was forced, Stefanski was forced to give up his playing call, wow. play calling duties or was um, uh, decided to do it himself. And you know, this is one of the really, really interesting things in the Know Your Foe episode, which I, it's uh, posted on Friday. So go back and take a listen to that if, if you can. Jake Burns is fantastic about going through the team. Very level-headed. No, There's no brown colored glasses, believe me, as he's going through that, but <laughs> is very frustrated with the team clearly and um, uh, with the Watson situation and uh, just very tired is how he started the episode describing his mood about what was going on. But he's got tremendous inside information on what's going on with the Browns. And uh, Dorsey apparently either via the direction of Haslam, which I think is unlikely or more likely it was from, from the direction of Barry, um, is giving up his play calling duties uh, for the offense, but they'll have a um, uh, he'll still be, I think, involved in in the offensive stuff. He'll still obviously be the head coach. He's been a two time coach of the year, so I don't think he's he's in danger of losing his job necessarily for next season. But uh, you know, there, there may be a, he may have gotten a directive that hey, how can you make this offense better? And Ken Dorsey was brought brought in to help you know, make the offense better. And now he's going to take over the play calling. And I think one supposition that Jake made was that that was done out of self-preservation, that he can externalize the offensive problems, Stavinsky can, by having some other coach do it and do no better. Right. Um, And, and, you know, obviously the Browns offense has been in the, in the absolute sewer. It's a a combination of problems here. A very poor offensive line, not a good receiving core. 
Uh, Joku is is a good player. Um, Betonio is very old, and you th- we'll get into some of the other problems that offense has. But um, it, it, just just out of out of self preservation, uh, this he may have been more than happy for this move to occur. But it's still not clear whether he's directed to do it or or maybe queried on whether it'd be a good idea, or maybe just came up with it himself. Yeah, and I think that even brings the element of surprise to the Ravens' doorstep more evident because Ken Dorsey's taken over. He's mm-hmm. going to probably have his own style, his own cadence. So it will be a challenge for the Ravens. And um, I think the main thing is can Orr come in with a game plan and continue to deviate from that plan when it doesn't go? Because we saw it all throughout these past five weeks. Bucks game, it was evident when we went on those six straight stops. But we kind of just let up near the end when it was the game was kind of in hand. But continuing to build off that in-game adjustment for him is going to be crucial this game against the Browns. Right. I, I this the the way the Bucks game script played out, unfortunate. The way the the Dallas game script played out, unfortunate. The games are similar in a sort of in in, in some sense because each of them was a win that was much closer than we would have liked. But each was also highly facilitated by a um, onside kick that succeeded. There's only been two in the entire NFL that have succeeded this year. <laughs> so both of them are Zay Flowers not collecting the football um, one one time out on a bad play, the other time on a, on just a, a play that probably nobody else would have had anyway, or it would have been a, a totally different type of player. I, it was interesting they they said at the podium today, and this was um, uh, Horton. Uh, saying, I think at the podium, the special teams coach, I think that's Horton, um, said said today that uh, they were talking about shifting around personnel. Mm. Uh, yeah, we could try some different things, have different people in different spots and whatnot. That may imply that their hands guy back there needs to be a little bigger because that would have been the what would have changed it. Aguilar, I believe, is one of the two guys, but he's the guy on the on the other side of the field they had had to be the designated catcher. Um, Flowers was the one on that side and so maybe they use somebody else maybe it becomes I don't know Tez Walker who's a little taller or a tight end or whatever it might be but you you, you do have some options to have a little more size over there yeah I'd rather have a tight end in that position uh, I'm not a fan of Aguilar's hands he's usually a double catcher so I don't I don't like that um, mm-hmm. Wallace would be a good candidate he's strong with the catch point and uh, I wouldn't put Babe in there just because of injury risk I think yep. um yeah, it, the fourth receivers and below and the tight ends would be my best option because the issue with the Zay Flowers onside is just he's not big enough to get up there and get that contact with the ball. So tight end would definitely be suitable for that situation. Right. Definitely got boxed out on the rebound as that, yep. that kick up, appeared. All right, let me move on. I, I My matchup is Jameis versus the troubled safeties. And – this is kind of like a, a great opportunity to get right for these safeties, and they have sucked. Marcus Williams, 12.5 yards per target, 143.9 opposition passer rating. Eddie Jackson, 13.2 yards per target. Strangely, also 143.9 opposition passer rating, which is incredible. It might be the same. I, I'll have to look and see if it's the same number of targets and yards and everything like that, but it's uh, uh, it's, it's really remarkably close otherwise. Um Ardarius Washington, I think they will stay with in the dime package on the back end, which restricts the number of total Eddie Jackson snaps. I did hear someone talking about, well, if they're bringing Molette back in there, won't they put um, Hamilton on the back end more? They might play less um, big nickel and more standard nickel having Molette back, um, and that would put Hamilton on the back end more. So it's possible. Um, I think, you know, Hamilton's going to remain as the dime back in the dime and he's going to remain in the big nickel and the big nickel. So they're still going to try and get him up at the line of scrimmage when they can. Um, I think because of that, we probably won't see a lot more Hamilton on the back end. I'm sure he could help that group. Um, and I'm still not sure it's the best use of him, but, but it, honestly, with what's going on, on the back end, it might be. So Ravens are going to try some different things. I, I, we'll see. We won't hear in advance. We'll just see what it happens when they finally decide that Eddie Jackson isn't the guy anymore, and we're we're sitting him on the bench. Um, I, my, I, I have a guess that they probably, when they do it, they will cut him and sign somebody else at that time. I don't think that they'll 
just have him festering on the bench for a period of time after he's gone. They did it with Rocky Yassin last year. So, you, you know, they thought of a guy as additional depth at that point. Um, but it's not clear to me they'll, they'll do that. But this is, you know, it's, they may have an opportunity to simplify the system against Jameis. In a, in a lot of ways, it's see quarterback, read quarterback, go get the football with Jameis. You want to be playing a lot of zone defense. He, he's happy to rip the ball into small windows. And uh, you just need to be ready to make plays on the football. Yeah, and uh, Eddie Jackson has definitely been the sa- like the safety group has been disappointing as a whole this year, but Eddie Jackson in particular only because I know we didn't bring him in on a big deal or anything, but the depth and the style we like with that uh, split field safety that we had in Stone, that operation for our defense is key, and to not have that crucial aspect be able to work out like it did last year is. Disappointing, to say the least. Um, I don't know if when Mallette comes back, that just means – I just I, I assume Ardarius is going to play that split safety role with Williams. If uh, when Mallette comes back, I don't think they're going to be playing around with um, Eddie Jackson for too long. He uh, He is the reason why we're considering a trade at safety right now. Uh, the offense definitely doesn't need help too much other than, uh, I don't know. People are asking for a receiver. I think we're good. Right. But go ahead. So to, just to be clear, Eddie Jackson has really underperformed relative to any kind of hope. There's no doubt about that. Um, a lot of people would, I think, justifiably say Marcus Williams has been a bigger disappointment, yep. even though he probably has gotten a little better as the season has gone on. But he's been a bigger disappointment in terms of what they're paying him. And the 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 position the Ravens put themselves in is that they don't have anyone now who can replace Williams at free safety. So if if they their only strategy at this point is hope that Williams will play better at the at the free safety position, other than going out and making a trade and having a backup free safety that immediately replaces Jackson as a split field guy, which I think is perfectly reasonable thing that they'll do. Um, our Darius Washington didn't have the greatest game either. So I, I would really believe that they may still keep Jackson in a fairly limited role right. only on the field when they play big nickel. Um, and then when they go, when they play dime, I, I expect it's going to be our Darius based on, on how they've deployed the last couple of games. So we'll, I, I that's what I, I believe we're going to see anyway. I think they, they have a high tolerance for veterans and they're, they're just going to give it one more week. And at some point this season, and it won't be forever down the road, they're going to decide, look, enough is enough. we got to, we got to make a change. Yeah, and, and I think Ardarius does well in the box and as a the nickel or the dime. He, the only issue is that his hands have been questionable, especially yeah. the past two opportunities he had to pick the ball off. Um, we need those turnovers. And uh, thank gosh one of them – was a touchdown drive regardless 90 yards but we can't make the defense the offense go long yard all the time okay so i'll ask you i'll put this in the form of a question okay which is worse not getting to a football all year to be in a position to intercept it or getting to two footballs in two or three weeks that he's been playing deep and failing to catch it and admittedly the second one went right through his hands for a big completion so it's this is not an easy question necessarily to answer but which would you prefer which gives us a better prospects for the future. Let's maybe put it that way. In terms Definitely of, the, the latter, only yeah, because yeah. he's getting to the spot and he's able to know where to be. And uh, he just has to finish. So, but I don't know what it is. It's like he's just, he gets too excited when he gets close to the ball. I don't know. Definitely have to work on that. Yeah, it's, we didn't see the, a fear of the football or anything this, this whole summer. He actually, at, at, particularly at the end of camp, he was playing as well as anybody other than Marlon Humphrey, probably. Marlon Humphrey was the best player at all camp. But wow. uh, best player probably on either side of the ball, but certainly on the defense uh, all camp. So uh, I I really hope Washington can, can figure it out too. But, uh, but anyway, big get-right game in, in that perspective. Yep. So on to my next point. I have the Ravens linebackers versus the middle of the field. Uh, we've had – issues being exposed over the middle field this year and uh, for many reasons, but 
I'm looking for Roquan specifically to have a bounce back game in terms of pass coverage. Uh, he's been all over the field in tackles, uh, been okay in the run game this year, but he's really lacked in pass uh, pass coverage, getting his drops, trying to get in the right windows. Um, and Joku has been a raving killer over the past couple years, and I continue to see that trend this week. So a lot of seams, a lot of hitch, hitches in the middle of the field, and those things could come to arise this week, and they're going to try and target Roquan, and um, I, I expect him to be ready for the opportunity this week. Roquan's playing very well right now. He's, he's made his last um, 59 tackles without a miss since the last tackle he missed was in week two so that's an incredible run 18 in this last game he's forced and fall fumble he's hitting people hard he drew that face mask by the sidelines I, I I'm I'm happy with where he is I think part of what's what's making Roquan's job difficult there's multiple multiple things it's mostly the players around him though it's mostly the two safeties right. on the back end being really indecisive about where they're going williams problem is, is mostly indecision i would say jackson there's been too many coverage drops <laughs> um, it, it's a, uh with with the uh, the other thing about roquan is that um and this this is more an or issue is that i really don't like the way he's being used on as many a gap blitzes as he is yes. and and if they have to do it i would like them to do what tampa did which is basically um, stagger their 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 uh, a gap uh, sim pressure off the line of scrimmage by about two yards. And if you do that, then you, you know there's some choice of gap, and there is you don't have that instant at the beginning where the offensive lineman is immediately fooled or whatnot. But you're also in a better position to drop the coverage. And we saw we we you know, we saw immediately the play that Baker and and company had designed to go out into the right flat for for a you know real solid gain of 13 yards just because Roquan couldn't possibly get back to that spot. Yeah, and those kind of issues in coverage, I mean, you really can't blame him. It's just scheme at yep. that point. So mm -hmm. those things he can't control, and like you mentioned, the safeties aren't helping him as well. And I, I don't think there uh, is an issue with the running mate next to him because other than when Harrison's in the game because he's just going to get exposed in space. And then... Uh, it, he hasn't played any inside linebacker since I don't think since, since KC, right? It was, yeah, it might be week two. He had one snap or something, but it wasn't. It, it he's hardly played there since that game. They they knew they'd made a big mistake right away, right? Um, and 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 Simpson. Then they went to the dime in week three against Dallas, and since then, you know, first of all, they won five straight games. It had, the dime hasn't performed uniformly outstanding. At least it'd be hard to dissect that because there are a lot of other countercurrents going on there. Most notably, that Eddie Jackson was in for a lot of plays right. when they were in dime, um, and so you you really don't know. You, you can't see the, the the full effect. I don't think yet of how good that dime defense has been, but I think they'll stick with that. I think that's the one that gives them the best chance in the middle of the field to add a a prime defender. Agreed. All right, so my, my second one is the front four slash five versus the Cleveland offensive line. Obviously, it's usually four when it's on a passing down. Um, it can be five if they're in a base package um, or or if you think of it as they're bringing a blitzer from somewhere, whether it's a, a, a slot corner, uh, inside linebacker, whatever, whatever it might be. Um, but the, the front four and five. The Cleveland pass blocking is an absolute dumpster fire this year. Both tackles are terrible. Um, uh, Jedrick Wills has been a big disappointment. Um, it, it was a strength probably last year. I'm sorry, the interior was a strength last year, but now everybody all of a sudden is getting older and is not as good. And there's there's problems with the the quality of player next to you that's kind of exponentiated the issues. But then we have, they have three very rec rec recognizable names on the interior with with Posick at center and. Um, uh, Teller and Betonio at guards, and Betonio. I mean, he's he's headed to the Cleveland Ring as honor as soon as he retires. He's he's you know one of their really great offensive linemen of the New Browns era, along with Joe Thomas. And you know he he just looks old right now is the word I'm getting from Jake Burns. So um, they need to scheme up singles for this for that. It'd be very important to have a healthy Travis Jones for this game. Right now, he's DNP, then he's limited 
on the first two days of practice. So we'll see tomorrow if he can be have that usual path of DNP limited full, which gets him back on the field. But the Ravens really need that. If they don't have that, then I think there'll be a lot of burden placed on um, Pierce to be on the field on passing downs with um, Matabike, and that'll create more pressure on snap count there that I'm not really fond of. Jones is a guy who eats a lot of snaps. One of the problems with the defense in the fourth quarter was Jones only played two snaps. He was hurt, and um, you know they they just they didn't have him out there. They were using Pierce and Matabike to try and get the you know the same effect, but they didn't they didn't get a single pressure other than on a two point try from the interior defensive line that entire fourth quarter. So that was a big part of of you know how things kind of broke down. Um, the Ravens have done better than that this year, and they they, they really need to do better uh, this week against Cleveland. Yep, and I I do anticipate Cleveland coming out and trying to establish the run with the new offensive coordinator in Dorsey. So that rotation, if Travis Jones is not available, is going to be it's going to be tested, especially with a big guy like Pierce. He's going to have to play a lot of snaps, like you mentioned. I think um, the only thing that would scare me is are they going to try and kick Van Noy inside and then maybe trying to make that four and then the fifth option. And then I'm just, I'm just confused if someone goes down, what is their contingency plan? Okay. So they did that. They played the dime 27 times, I believe in this last game. And it was 14 and 13. I forget if it was, which was 14, which was 13, but effectively it was half of the time they used a, rush dime which means they use three outside linebackers instead Mm -hmm. of two so they already have adjusted some for that and one of the good things is all three of their sacks came with the rush dime on the field so they they were getting the outside linebacker situation to work and the the inside it was the interior defensive line just had a really bad game um uh in this case so uh hopefully you know they got to get in Jameis's face if they do that I'm confident they're gonna they're gonna force errors, and Jameis will always give you a few unforced errors as well, yeah. <laughs> uh, just based on who he is. By the way, I had not heard this story, but apparently last year, um, Jameis was playing for another team in Atlanta, and um, they called for a kneel down from the sidelines to end the game, and he audibled it, and he audibled it to a to a touchdown run. Yep. Yeah, so you're you're aware of this, okay? I, I, one of the things about doing this analysis is I focus much more on the Ravens games than I do on the rest of the NFL. So I, I if I knew it, I forgot it. Let's put it that way. <laughs> um, but that's unforgivable. I mean, you know, that is just unforgivable for for your quarterback to do that to you. Yeah, I think he. Uh, I think it was because Alvin Kamara was like one touchdown short of something. I don't know, and they were up like almost sixty. So okay. Yeah, I don't know exactly why Jameis did that, but definitely doesn't bode well. And uh, it's like in a brotherhood league like the NFL, you can't do as sportsmanship. You can't do that. But I um back to the offensive line versus I mean yeah, Bart Brown's offensive line. I expect to see a lot of pressure all day, um, especially if they can't establish the run, because that's the only way they're going to be able to neutralize the Ravens' pass rush. Um, and then also the Ravens have to score on offense, which I anticipate. But if that doesn't happen, the run is going to be able to be in play. And um, the Ravens have shown some issue to stop the run the past couple of weeks and uh, hoping that doesn't get exposed this week. What would be your over-under on points scored for the Ravens this week? It's it's not a great Browns team, but they probably are a little bit better defensively. I think they 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 know the Ravens pretty well. They match up against the Ravens reasonably well on defense. I'm talking, but twenty seven and a half. Okay, I was going to say thirty three. Okay, uh, I th- I think it's I think it's yeah, it'd be above their their average against the rest of the league still, where they've had you know thirty one. But I think that that. Uh, uh, if if they're going to get up to that total, one thing I'd be counting on is that, um, you know, Winston is going to make some errors that could yeah. put him in, give in us some, give him some possessions for sure. Yeah. yeah, I mean, four touchdowns seems like it's possible if I were to do the over under or do the over on twenty seven and a half because, okay. I mean, Henry is almost good for one or two a game, and then Lamar he's he could throw for two himself. So I just uh, 
I I know that Jameis is going to give us one, and we have to capitalize on every single opportunity. So that's that's the one thing that we definitely need to focus on on offense is just that conversion rate. All right. Well, outstanding. Uh, Frazier, always fun doing this show with you. Tell folks where they can talk football with you online. You guys can reach me at Twitter slash X at F underscore Rave 8. That's F underscore R-A-V-E-8. All right. Thanks for listening, folks. If you if you uh, have the thought to do it, please show this show to somebody else. Uh, retweet it, uh, like and subscribe, or show it to a friend directly off the website. Uh, that would be the best. Anyway, for Frazier Depar, this is Ken McCusick saying goodbye. We'll talk to you next time on Matchups.